Hello and welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout for Wednesday, January 8th, 2020. Happy New Year, happy new decade, everybody. My name is Morgan Renberg, Chief Scientist at the Fort Worth Museum of Science and History. And we are coming to you live today with a whole new crew and a whole new setup and a whole new way of doing anything and everything. And yet we're persevering. It's working. Fraser, Pamela, half our usual crew is at the American Astronomical Society meeting in Florida. I think they're probably like on the beach or checking out a volcano or something way cooler than what we're doing right now. But we will persevere. And I'm joined today by our producer of everything is Susie Murph. Hi, everybody. Hey, Susie. So this is like so, your first time on the Weekly Space Hangout, I think. It actually is. Usually I'm behind the scenes, setting everything up and doing all that. But yeah, this is my first visit. So hopefully I won't screw it up. Yeah, we're going to talk about some cool things today. We're going to talk a little bit about volcanoes on Venus, a medical emergency on the space station, a new Earth-sized planet in the habitable zone, catch up on Starliner, and maybe even get a special report from Fraser on Starlink. But I know this is going to be an awesome episode because we have a truly amazing guest with us. He's not only patient, but <laughs> brilliant and going to wow us with what he knows. Dr. Brian Whedon, welcome. Glad to be here, everybody. Hey, Brian. So you're the director of program planning at the Secure World Foundation, but that's just the latest in a decades-long career of space wizardry. You've chaired committees for NOAA and the World Economic Forum. You are an Air Force officer at uh, the Joint Space Operations Center. You've basically lived and breathed space your whole life. Wow. <laughs> yeah, and it's probably a little bit different side of space than what people uh, typically see. Uh, so I, I, I'm looking forward to talking about it. Yeah, so let's start with your job now. What does it mean to be uh, the director of program planning? Well, why don't I start with what our foundation does, because we're a bit unique in ourselves. Uh, we're a private operating foundation uh, with offices in Colorado and D.C., and our mission is uh, ensuring the long-term sustainability of the space environment so we can use it for benefits here on Earth. That means that we are concerned about the things like orbital debris and con frequency congestion and conflict in space that could jeopardize our ability to use Earth orbit and all the other parts of space for all the great things that we do, like weather forecasting and GPS and satellite communications uh, and science and exploration and everything else. So our focus is on the, the policies and laws and sort of the cooperation and um, uh, the standards and all that stuff on how we can more sustainably use Earth orbit and then provide benefits back here on Earth. Um, but you're basically what we describe as like a think tank, right? You're helping the legislators, the policy people understand what's important. Yeah, we do a little bit of that. Um, so uh, we're more of what they would call a do tank in that a small part of what we do is publishing research and studies like a think tank would do. A lot of what we do is organizing panel discussions and workshops and meetings that bring together the stakeholders from the government, from academia, from the satellite operators to discuss these issues and try and work out solutions. Uh, and, and, and so that's so we work with think tanks and we our, our office in Washington DC is located right next to a couple other big, really big think tanks. Uh, so we're well aware of that world, but we're more focused on, you know, doing a lot of our own work and running a lot of our own meetings and, and doing some of our own events to try and actually create solutions, not just talk about this problem. Well, this must be a pretty exciting time to be working in this area because I have to imagine that things look pretty different today than they did when you first got into the business. Absolutely. So uh, I um, so I was I entered the Air Force uh, in 1999. I spent about 10 years there. Uh, my last job in the Air Force was working for the, the, the squadron that tracks all the stuff in space and produces a satellite catalog. Uh, and so that, that was sort of my first big exposure to space. Um, for the last 10 years, I've been working with Secure World on more of the policy side of things. And, and yeah, it, it's, it's night and day. You know, when we first started talking about space sustainability back in 2008 and 2009, most people were like, why do we 
care about that you know why would orbit ever be not sustainable right what it's just it's just space space is big 10 years later it's a very hot topic something that is you know becoming a centerpiece of national policies and something that a lot of different governments are working on something that, that all these companies are involved in uh, and just you know something that is increasingly critical to the future of how we use space yeah, so let's jump in with what's kind of become the emblem of the opportunities and the challenges that this new era of space uh, is bringing us. And of course, that's Starlink. We've talked for, for months and years on the show about Starlink. But on Monday, they launched their third batch of satellites. So they got 180 satellites in space. That makes them among the largest satellite operators the largest. Uh, in the world. They're going to launch one or two more batches this month with launches coming up between now and the summer when they hope to have enough satellites, hundreds of satellites in, in orbit, enough to start their sort of bumpy com commercial service. Uh, what do you see uh, from the perspective of sort of maintaining this access to space as, as the biggest effect of these new satellite constellations? Yeah, so, so Starlink is probably the most well-known of several of these uh, efforts by different companies in the U.S. and elsewhere to develop um, large constellations of satellites, mostly in low Earth orbit, so between, let's say, 500 kilometers and about 1,500 kilometers altitude, to provide broadband internet services. Uh, it's not a new idea. There were companies such as Teledesic and a bunch of others back in the late 90s that had very similar proposals that never panned out. There was also a company called Iridium that is around today and sort of was partly successful in that they did a satellite telephone service, but it never became the big thing that it was meant to be. So Starlink and OneWeb and Telesat and all these others are sort of the next iteration of all of that. Um, we again look at, as you sort of said, is like opportunities and challenges. So the opportunity is they may be able to deliver broadband internet to the world and the parts of the world that can't get access to landline internet for a pretty good price. And that would be a huge benefit to society. The challenge is how do you deal with thousands and thousands of new satellites um, that are kind of packed into a relatively small area and keep them from colliding with each other, colliding with other things, um, and also all the radio frequency spectrum coordination challenges. Uh, at the moment, there are roughly 2,200 functional satellites on orbit. And so Starlink by itself, if they get to 10,000 satellites, would increase that by more than an order of magnitude, uh, let alone if all the other constellations get up there. Um, uh, you mentioned though that you know space is big, and these satellites are small. So even if we're increasing by an order of magnitude the number of satellites that are up there, what does that look like? How does that translate into yep. op operational challenges? So so space is absolutely big, and I would say up until 2009, the mantra was big sky theory, right? Lots of space in space. And the odds of anything hitting else is minuscule, don't worry about it. And then in early 2009, we had two satellites collide. Uh, an Iridium satellite collided with a dead Russian satellite, and it created a couple thousand pieces of debris. And suddenly, space was no longer so big anymore. And, and, it, and it turns out that while space is absolutely huge, right, if you calculate the volume between 100 kilometers and 36,000 kilometers, that, that the volume of that spherical shell, it's absolutely massive, but we don't use all of that. The, the distribution of satellites in orbit is not uniform. It's, there are certain orbits that are really, really beneficial because they have unique properties. And so the satellites tend to be clustered there. And, and then because we've always had satellites in those orbits, the debris tends to be clustered in that same area because the debris is a result of the activities. So, so that's the real challenge is that this stuff is not uniformly distributed. It's clustered in certain areas. And, and really the, the highest highly congested area is between about 600 and 900 kilometers in low Earth orbit. Um, that generally relates to what we call sun synchronous orbits, which are fantastically useful for things like taking pictures, collecting science data, you know, missions where you need to have predictable overflights and where having you know predictable uh, 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 earth sun angles is really useful um, so that's where a lot of stuff is going you know by the way it turns out it's also where they want to put all these large constellations because they're down close to the earth so they can minimize 
the delay in sending packets up these satellites and back down. So, so that's the real challenge is that it's not uniformly distributed. So there's already thousands of pieces of debris and several hundred functional satellites in the same area where Starlink and others want to put thousands of more satellites. So what do you see as the solution to this? Like, to me, this kind of reminds me a little bit of like, if I pick up my cell phone and make a call and and you answer that call, you know, you might be on Verizon, I'm on (laughs) T-Mobile. In in a sense, it's the same problem, right? There's a finite amount of airspace and radio spectrum. And yet all these private companies, governments, radio stations want to share that space. And, And we've come up with a solution for that. Uh, in the spectrum space, is a similar sort of top-down approach the right answer for for space space? So, uh, I'll start by saying we also have exactly that same problem in space, the spectrum part. These Starlink satellites are going to be communicating on the same some of the same uh, frequencies that are already being used by other satellites in geo orbit, and are also planning to be used by 5G broadband con- uh, uh, terrestrial networks. And so there's been a huge discussion for 10 years or so about how do we allow these new services to use those frequencies in a way that's not going to create interference for everybody else. So that, that, that is an ongoing problem that we think we have solved, but we've never done this before. So we don't really know what the right solution is because no one's ever run constellations of thousands of satellites all trying to communicate on the same frequencies as terrestrial and geo networks. So then, let's, so then flip over to the, the physical congestion piece that you mentioned. Uh, again, the challenge is we've never seen this before. And, and so there's been a lot of studies done by NASA and the European Space Agency and other you know, academic institutions to try and determine what is the negative impact of these constellations and what should the policies and regulations be to manage them. And, and the answer is then we really don't know because it's a, it's a new problem that no one's ever dealt with before. Um, and then the other challenge is the, there weren't a lot of good existing licensing mechanisms in place before this has happened. So we don't really have the tools to license them. And the companies are, are pushing pretty hard to say, look, let us go figure it out. Trust us that we'll get it right. Because if we don't, you know, we have an incentive to get it right because it's our business model and we need to get it right. Um, so we're in a situation right now where um, you know, Starlink is launching, as you said. OneWeb is going to start launching later this year, their constellation. And, and basically, the, the rules they've been given are don't screw it up. They, they have not been given a lot of very strict guidelines that are different from anybody else's. And so we're going to have to wait and see how it goes. And, and you know, I, I hope that things are going to work out well, and they do have an incentive to kind of manage it themselves and not screw things up because it is their business. And if they have a bunch of collisions or create a bunch of debris, then that's going to negatively impact themselves. So hopefully that's enough of incentive. Yeah. Well, even if everyone's doing everything right, you know, it's fair to assume that accidents happen. There's going to be collisions. And, you know, I've watched the film Gravity and it, you know, it paints this sort of post-apocalyptic view of what happens if we get one collision. What does that look like in reality? You know, suppose... Uh, yeah. a two Starlink satellites bumped together. Yeah. What what would we see happen? So, um, by the way, that movie came. We had a whole debate in my field whether it was good or not, because it did portray a, a a unrealistic vision of things, but it also brought a lot of attention to the issue. Uh, so the, there's an ongoing discussion about that. So here's what I'll say: the the so-called Kessler syndrome, which is the the phenomenon name for NASA scientist Don Kessler. Uh, that's related to debris stuff is more like climate change than it is a nuclear reaction. It is not one event that's going to set off a, a very fast series of events and suddenly in five minutes or a couple of days, space is unusable. It's more of a slow accumulation of bad things that have a growing negative impact. And a few decades down the road, what we're going to find is it may be too costly to operate in certain orbits and certain types of missions may not be affordable anymore, you know, which means that we may not be able to afford to operate a weather satellite at 800 kilometers. Well, you might have to move a different altitude, which may not be as useful or provide as good of data. And then so that that suffers. That's the sort of thing that we're looking at is more of an opportunity cost 
over the long term than sort of the apocalyptic scenario provided in, in gravity. Now, the, the way it could be really, really bad is for human spaceflight, right? Because humans operate at around 400, 450 kilometers in the ISS and in future space stations, and all this debris comes down through them. And so that is that could be a really bad day if a piece of debris hits a human spaceflight platform, and and, and, and you know that could lead to immediate loss of life. Uh, now, NASA has procedures in place to try and prevent that, um, but but. That is a, a really, you know, scenario we definitely want to avoid as well. I have to admit that I'm not particularly uh, thrilled with the, the climate change comparison because we're obviously not doing a very good job of, of heading that off. And yes. this is the same sort of incremental problem where there's a, a diffusion of responsibility. Yep. And, and so yep. is, there, is there something other than trying to regulate, uh, you know, who goes where? Are there things we should be doing now to prepare for the eventuality, let's assume the climate change thing happens and this is 50 years yeah. from now, we have all these collisions. What should we be doing now to get ready for that world? Well, th there's a lot of stuff going on right now. So one of them is there have, there's been an international effort since the mid 2000s to create uh, basically standards for how to deal with your, with your stuff at the end of mission. Um, the biggest one is what they call the 25 year rule that you shouldn't leave any of your satellites of the stuff on orbit longer than 25 years. And, and, and that is widely accepted internationally as sort of the, 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 the minimum you should be doing. Um, and there's been, you know, growing acceptance of that in practice. Um, the other big one is what they call passivation. So you've got our upper stage that put a satellite in orbit. Traditionally, we just left it in orbit as well. And maybe it had some leftover fuel in the upper stage. Well, over years and decades in a, in a hot, cold, hot, cold environment and with lots of radiation, those fuels might mix and suddenly boom, and I've got thousands of little pieces of debris. Um, so there's been a stronger effort to passivate upper stages by depleting all the remaining fuel, by draining all the batteries, getting those kind of energy sources. Um, so, so those are some of the, the things that are already underway in terms of international standards to try and do this. Um, where it's been lacking, though, is in making those mandatory. A lot of that is still voluntary, and we're still trying to work to convince governments to put in place national policies and regulations to make that stuff mandatory. Um, the other big thing we're working on is improving space situation awareness. That's the term for how we know what's up in space. Basically, telescopes and radars on Earth, and in some cases, satellites that are tracking things in orbit and it's how we understand the debris population and sort of the impacts. There's a lot of work going on to improve that, which then improves our understanding of the environment, which then improves our ability to avoid collisions and, and lots of other stuff. Um, the last thing is actually what we call active debris removal or remediation, and that's just getting rid of the existing debris. Both NASA and the European Space Agency have done studies to show that we are going to need to remove five or 10 of the biggest objects, debris objects, per year to stabilize the long-term growth. Doesn't sound like a lot, but we're talking something probably the size of a bus that you need to go up and grab and then pull down to low Earth orbit. With current propulsion and, and you know just kind of space launch costs, that is not a cheap thing to do. And, and trying to do five or 10 of those per year is not an inconsequential cost. So we're still working to try and convince governments to start funding that. Um, there's recent success. The European Space Agency has announced a program called Clean Space, where they're putting up some money uh, for a company to go up and remove a relatively small, dead European satellite. But it's a start, and it's kind of the first of its kind. And, and we hope that's going to be successful and kind of show the way forward of, of how to do that in the future. So I want to move a little bit beyond uh, low Earth orbit and, and think about what happens as these private companies start going farther and farther. We saw last year the attempted landing of Bereshit, set mm -hmm. to be the first private lander on the moon. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if we see a trajectory uh, for these missions like we've seen in low Earth orbit, you know, 10 years from now, we'll be talking about, you know, dozens or hundreds of, of landings on, on the moon. Mm -hmm. Now, what do we have to do like, to manage that? Um, you know, what happens if somebody wants to land and pick up uh, a piece of 
uh, the Apollo 11 Lem and bring it back. Uh, you know, where you know we're sort of already yep. in the midst of the problem in low Earth orbit. How can we head off these issues uh, farther out? Well, so this is a problem, a term we use is space governance, a little g, and that's sort of the generally for how we manage and provide oversight of these kind of activities. Um, so the good news is, is that there is a broad international legal framework to deal with this. Um, the Outer Space Treaty, Article 6, says that nations are responsible for providing authorization and continuing supervision of their own national space activities and those of their private sector entities. And we have many countries, sort of the US and all the major spacefaring countries are, are states parties to that treaty. And so they are obligated to provide this supervision, this authorization and supervision. The challenge comes in how you actually do that. Historically, that's been done through licensing, particularly for the, the commercial stuff. So there are three government agencies, the FAA, NOAA, and the FCC in the US that each have a licensing process for something different. The FAA licenses commercial launches, NOAA licenses commercial cameras taking pictures from space, and the FCC licenses commercial use of spectrum for satellites. The problem is, what do you do something that doesn't fall in one of those buckets? None of those licenses include private space stations or mining water on the moon. So there's been a debate for about 10 years now in the US government of how do we modernize this licensing framework to actually be able to A, say yes to these companies because we kind of want the innovation to happen. We, we're looking forward to this. So how do we give them that, that, that approval? But then also how does the US government ensure that they're gonna follow the international principles and, and, and not create problems? There, there's been some progress on that and not, and not so much progress on that. Uh, it generally falls under the label of space traffic management which is sort of this, this general term for how do we do oversight of this stuff. Um, the Obama administration spent six or seven years sort of debating it and, our, and talking about it. Um, the Trump administration came in and sort of picked up where that left off and finished that discussion and published uh, Space Policy Directive 3 uh, in June of 2018, uh, which said that they envisioned the U.S. Department of Commerce would take, a, take over and play this role of providing oversight of all these activities. Um, and that a, an existing office would be elevated to become a Bureau of Space Commerce and would be sort of the one-stop shop for companies to come to to get licensed to provide oversight. The challenge is in the US that we have a divided power in the government and Congress has not yet passed legislation to give commerce all these new powers, nor have they provided the money to fund it. So, we're, so in the US, we're sort of in this holding pattern um, to try and, 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 and get this figured out. Um, Internationally, there's a lot of the countries in the same boat in that they might have existing remote sensing or existing frequency licensing, but they don't really have anything else. And so a lot of countries are right now trying to figure out, given their national system, what government agencies should be responsible for doing this licensing. Then the question becomes, what does license contain, right? What sort of standards should they be held to? And again, that is currently being debated. Um, all we have in international law are these very broad principles, non-interference, um, uh, you know, don't, don't harm the space environment, uh, these sorts of things that have never really been fleshed out. So there, there have been some, uh, what we would call a, a, a track two discussion or track 1.5, which is like, you know, kind of an unofficial group of some, some government experts and some academic experts and some, some uh, companies trying to come up with uh, what may be some, some ways forward. There's going to be a meeting, uh, a big UN meeting that's coming um, uh, late March, early April, where they're going to start discussing this issue. Uh, but of course, that means that they're many years away from actually finish, finalizing up with it. So I mean, the, the good news is, I would say that there are people thinking about this and how do we you know, authorize uh, asteroid mining? How do we authorize you know, lunar bases and private space station, all kind of stuff. But we're still a ways from having a definition on this. And my guess is that it's going to be, you know, the companies are going to have to be pushing a little bit harder to, to get the government to take action on this. And we're probably going to have to be a learning process, sort of like the, the, the Starlink constellation, right? 
probably going to be a learning process as companies are going through it that we then start putting in place for the, the licensing on it. I'm interested in, in sort of what you think about uh, the value of international cooperation when it comes to, to these things, both on the regulatory side, but also on the, in, from the perspective of um, doing the exploration or the technology development. You know, it's well known that, that NASA is forbidden from working with China uh, on even sort of minor technical things that might help, help them help the lunar rovers that China has on, on the moon, for example. Do, do you think there's, that that's a sensible thing to have given the, the broader security context? Or do you think that that's sort of standing in the way of, of things that are, are more good than bad? I look, uh, the, the, the tagline for our foundation is promoting cooperative solutions. So yes, we, ab we absolutely believe in, in cooperative endeavors in part because space is an international endeavor, right? It does, it's not owned by anyone. It's not anyone's sole domain. It is the, the, the kind of domain of all humanity and everybody has equal right to explore it and, and participate in it. Um, I, I certainly would like to see more cooperation in, in space, particularly in exploration missions. Uh, I think we need to be realistic about it though. Um, we need to keep in mind that, you know, historically human spaceflight was motiv motivated first and foremost by national prestige and national security. It wasn't really for peace and harmony and bringing everybody together. Uh, that was, you know, the, the, the driving motivation for the Apollo program was beating the Soviets and showing that we had a better system than, than, this, than this, the communist system. Uh, and, and by the way, once that, you know, national security prestige motivation went away, we saw a lot of the, the political will to go do this stuff went away. Um, and, and the newer players coming to the game, the, the Indias, the, the, the Chinas um, and, and, and others are, are very much in that same mode of prestige and, and, and showing, using this example show that, you know, yes, we can be a space power too. But I still think there's quite a bit of room for, for, for collaboration and, and for cooperation. Um, in, in part because, you know, this is really hard and really expensive to do. And, it's, it's really difficult for one country to try and do it on their own. Um, there's also a lot of potential benefits that could be uh, gotten from, from exploration. Um, so as far as the China issue, uh, you know, that's a really thorny problem. Um, the, uh, the infamous Wolf Amendment referred to, uh, it basically says U.S. is not allowed to do any bilateral cooperation with China without prior permission from Congress. And, you know, the executive branch is very proud and they often don't like being asked to be told a mother may I sort of thing to go to Congress. So it's not that they can't, it's that they really haven't wanted to go ask permission uh, to kind of run those gauntlets uh, and go do it. Now they can do multilateral engagement. So if there's a multiple countries all coming together to cooperate in something, they can participate in that, but it's this bilateral stuff uh, where the challenge comes in. Uh, I, you know, me personally, I, I think, you know, hoping there's going to be human spaceflight cooperation with China in the next couple of years, that's probably not going to happen, uh, in part because we have different goals at the moment. China's immediate goal for the next five, 10 years is a space station, putting up their own space station and getting partners to participate in that. The U.S.'s goal over the next five, 10 years is going back to the moon with Artemis um, and our partners. So at the very least, there's a little bit of mismatch there in terms of what the goals are. I do think there's a lot of room for cooperation on things like science, heliophysics, um, some data sharing, things that are maybe a little less in the political limelight than the human space flight. Uh, that's probably a better place to start when you're looking at, at cooperation, particularly with someone like China. So we're, we're coming up on the end of our time, but I don't want to let you go without talking for a minute about Space Force. You know, we, we've had our share of fun, uh, poking fun at Space Force, but we've talked a lot too about about the the merits or or, or not of various pieces of it. And you know, we were chatting a little bit before we went live, and you were grousing a little bit about the, the sort of the amount of misnomers that are out there, uh, mis misinformation about what Space Force really is. C can you give us the 90-second yep. you know, summary of, of what it is? Yes. So Space Force is one answer to the question of how best do we organize and structure military space activities. We've had mi military activities in space since before NASA was even existed. 
uh, both military and intelligence activity in space, we call national security space activities. And for the last 20 years or so, the military stuff has largely been done by the Air Force, things like the GPS satellites or military weather satellites, military satellite communications, all of which has played an increasingly important role in how our military operates around the world and how we project power. There's probably not a military mission that, that happens around the world today that doesn't at this point require space to operate. So for, for national security, for our military, space is a really important thing. Um, and, and you know uh, we have potential adversaries in the world, we have competitors and they've, they know that and they've realized that. Um, and, and there's several of them that are developing what we call counter space capabilities or anti satellite, including anti satellite weapons, to try and disrupt uh, US space capabilities in, in a conflict. And, and we're doing the same thing. Uh, my organization, we publish a, a uh, unclassified open source report talking about who is doing what uh, in this realm. So, the last several years, well, for 20 years now, there has been this discussion over whether or not the US Air Force is still the, the best place to be running the majority of the space activities for the US military. There's some pros and cons there. I was an Air Force guy, you know, we, we did an okay job, I think. But, you know, as there's more and more of it, there's a question, should that, you know, aircraft jet fighter mentality be the same kind of culture you apply to how we operate in space? And I think increasingly the answer is probably no, there's maybe be a different culture. So then you get into this whole big bureaucratic question of how do you reorganize it? Um, the end result is, so, so President Trump, you know, a year and a half ago demanded a separate department of the Space Force that would be, in his words, you know, separate but equal and sit alongside Department of the Air Force, Department of the Navy, Department of the Army. That is not what happened. What happened was they created uh, what looks a lot like the Marine Corps, which is a separate service that sits inside the Department of the Air Force that is now going to be doing space. And all the, the 27,000 or so people that used to be Air Force Space Command back in early December, nowadays they're called they're, so they're called U.S. Space Command. They basically just changed a patch. So right now, it's exactly the same as it was a month ago. It's the same people, it's the same satellites, the same mission. They just changed their patch, changed their logo. The big question is what happens going forward. How much of a cultural change they want to make, how, how distinctive they want to make it from the Air Force, and, and, and do they want to change the mission of it at all from what it's been for the last 20 years. Well, if that's there's all one still thing, up in the air. If there's one thing that's been true about uh, the various branches since the founding of the country is that they don't always get along so well. No. Does, <laughs> does, does adding another layer of, of separation, bureaucracy here, cr create more problems potentially than it solves by uniting and separating some of these you know, disparate commands? Absolutely, and, and, and I've been skeptical this whole thing so far. Uh, you know, in part because of exactly that, that question, right? Is separating space out from all the other stuff going to improve things when it's most beneficial when it's integrated with, with air power and with land power and all that kind of stuff. So that is one of the big issues. Um, the other is, you know, we've spent thousands and thousands and thousands of staff hours trying to make this happen and figure out and get all these answers and talk about uniforms and all that kind of stuff just so we can get to a place where then we can address some of the really big problems. Like how do we buy satellites faster than a decade and at less than a billion dollars a pop? I would have rather spent all that time and effort fixing that problem than you know, making changes to then maybe fix the problem. But I think the proponents have something to have a point when they say, you know, we couldn't fix those problems because the existing culture and the existing organization just, just wasn't in a place where it could solve it. And so we had to start over and, and, and fix that so we can fix the problems. That may end up being right, but it's going to be years before we know, or longer before we know whether that was true or not. Well, Brian, thank you so much for your patience and for joining us. This has been just fascinating. Uh, where can people find out more if they want to learn what you're doing, what your organization is doing? Yeah, so um, we have a public website, um, swfound.org. Uh, and so, and everything we do is public domain. 
So we have lots of reports and lots of workshop summaries and papers up there uh, that cover a whole range of topics related to space policy and space law and space sustainability. Um, me personally, um, I'm pretty active on Twitter, uh, at Brian Whedon, um, and, and you'll find there a whole mix of space stuff and a bunch of things I'm interested in. Uh, and I'm, you know, usually tweeting about, you know, interesting, cool space stuff that's happening. Uh, so those are probably the two biggest ways to, to, to go keep track of what's going on. Well, I hope you'll come back in a couple of years, tell us how Space Force is panning out, and we'll look up and see, are there still any satellites? <laughs> Thank you so much, Brian. <laughs> Glad to be here. Thank you for having me on. All right. Well, I want to give a shout out to the Weekly Space Hangout crew. They are the group of heroes behind the scene making all of this work. They help keep the website going. They help find the guests. If you want to join them, you can go check out WSH wshcrew.space online, uh, join the Slack channel, get involved. Um, and I also want to thank Annie, who is lurking behind the scenes, uh, producing all of this so that I don't have to be pressing a million buttons. Uh, and Fraser, I see you at the top of my window. You've been lurking quietly. Uh, we talked for quite a while with Brian about what it looks like from a... Uh, sort of space organization perspective for how Starlink might be playing out. We didn't talk at all about what the impacts on science might have been. I understand you just came from a panel that looked into that. Uh, what did you find out? Uh, so I know I'm going to have, I'm going to be pretty loud to hear there's 3,500 astronomers here at the American Astronomical Society. Uh, so if you, if you need me to yell louder, just let me know. You sound just fine. Okay, all right. Um, but, uh, and of course, there's wind and there's a lot of uh, sirens going past, but uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so today has been Starlink Day here at the American Astronomical Society meeting. I've been in two press conferences or two conference meetings so far about this. I was really fortunate to find out that uh, someone from SpaceX was actually going to make a presentation this morning. So she's the uh, vice president in charge of governmental uh, regulations and and so more on the the legal side uh, and policy than on necessarily the engineering side and she said a lot of the things that we had already known about about Starlink about how they had modified they, they'd been in conversation with with astronomers that they had they had darkened one of the Starlink satellites on the latest launch of 60 to try and minimize the impact um, on on the night sky, and we're going to find out. Uh, I actually asked this question at the press conference today. No results so far. They have launched. One is darkened, but they still don't know actually how uh, what impact it's going to have. Right now, it looks like the Starlinks are like second-ish magnitude when they first launch, and they call this the the string of pearls, which I think is a, a you know, it's not a great name because um, it's as if they're like good things. Um, uh, but then they uh, they seem to fade to about fifth magnitude when they actually reach their operational altitude, which is still just barely visible with the unaided eye in dark skies. Um, and so the question is, can they get the the, the brightness down farther than that? Uh, astronomers have had a series of teleconferences with the with the folks at Starlink to try and make some of these regulations and they're just sort of waiting to see if the various darkening measures that they've taken are going to have an impact. And is this a topic of conversation like in the halls of double oh, yeah. astronomers just sort of idly talking about this? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's really two main themes here, right? I'm sure you can guess what the other one is. Uh, with the the 30 meter telescope and the protests that happened on the Big Island of Hawaii, so so really, it's Starlink and the 30 meter telescope are the two big conversations that are going on, and everybody has opinion. It's very polarizing, um, and uh, it's you know, I I mean, I'm hearing really great impassioned conversations by by both sides of every part of this, and. Uh, I haven't seen people actually fist fight yet. So I think so far it's still pretty civil. And have you heard any concerns or, or optimisms that we haven't really been talking about? You know, we've talked a lot about the effects on radio telescopes, the effects on optical telescopes. Are there other things that people are talking about? Yeah. So the, so the problem is the 
if you darken, like if you darken one of these satellites by painting it black, one of the downside is that you're now brightening it in the infrared spectrum. And so it could very well be that to minimize the impact for the visible astronomers, you are increasing their visibility in the eyes of the infrared astronomers. And so it's actually a very difficult challenge and it is going to require a lot of experiments to try and figure this out. You know, is, it, is there going to be a certain color that you can get to where both the infrared astronomers and the visible astronomers have the same decrease in, in brightness? The other thing, and this is sort of a, this has been less looked at, but it sounds like it's a much more serious issue, is the impact on the radio astronomers. Uh, in some cases, you know, radio astronomers have, have been quite used to satellites being so bright they can actually burn out their equipment as they pass overhead that they actually have to to shut down their equipment when the satellite passes overhead and there will always be a tele you know one of many of these overhead and in fact they were able to um make one web and starlink and any future constellations actually give up one eighth of the spectrum that they were originally planning to use in the 250 megahertz range because it is sort of it had already been agreed that they wouldn't be able to use this. And Starlink and, and OneWeb ha have agreed that they won't be going into that. And that's, you know, they've, they've essentially had to give up one eighth of their, um, uh, of their spectrum. Oh. Yeah, of their bandwidth spectrum. So, so obviously, you know, there's, there's existing yeah. legal requirements in terms of how they can broadcast, as well as now sort of new rules that have to be figured out. And I think that, you know, the real concern from the astronomers is that it's just, it's all just happening without any conversation. So quickly. You know, so quickly. And, and sorry, there's a, there's a bunch of carts going right past me here. Um, yeah, I feel like super loud. Um, and, so, and so the, 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 and so that right now, really, the, like the, the astronomers who are presenting their side of the story, that, that it's kind of a foregone conclusion. There's no regulations that are going to protect astronomy. It is purely going to come down to the goodwill of, that SpaceX wants to have with the astronomical community to get this done. And obviously, for a lot of people, that, that's no assurance whatsoever. They are, you know... Uh, that that horse has left the stable, and and these companies are going to do whatever they want within the regulations that they've already received from the from the FCC, and they don't really have any concern about what the astronomers want. Now, it's a great sign that the that that they are working with astronomers, but there's no kind of expectation on their part that in the end, astronomy is going to get what it wants out of this. So, I don't want to keep you. What's the one coolest thing that isn't Starlink that you've seen so far? Uh, well, I, it's, and this is coming, but we've had a chance to see all the four new, and they're calling, NASA's calling them the four great observers, the new great observatories. So it's going to be Louvoir, Habex, Origins, and Lynx. And these are the four follow-on successor spacecraft that are being defined by the Decadal 2020 survey. And, and, you know, we talked about them two years ago. And now each one has really moved to its final recommendation stage and they've produced a ton more information. Each one has really in-depth documents about what's gonna be in these telescopes. They've got much more finalized understandings of what these are gonna be able to do. And so getting a chance to see physical models, some of the actual hardware that's gonna be flying in these telescopes, prototype um, cryo coolers and uh, scintillation, um, uh, devices. It's quite exciting to sort of see what 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 comes in. A lot of you seen this. There's like a Lego version of Louvoir that actually folds up and deploys and has little servos behind yes, all please. of this. Yeah, no, I know it's awesome. So so that's the part that I think uh, has been great to see the progress that's been made on all of these big telescopes. Well, that sounds awesome. I'm gonna let you go. Go yeah, surf. Go get right on the now. beach. Do all the fun yeah. stuff. Yeah, right. Uh, we'll hold down the fort. Uh, you're doing a great job. I, it's it's wonderful just to show up and just provide some news. And now I'm gonna, Isn't now I'm gonna it head nice? on again. I love it. All right, thanks, Morgan, <laughs> and care. thanks to everyone behind the scenes. And we'll see you all next week. All right, Susie, let's talk a little bit about volcanism on Venus. And and by the way, for those of you watching at home, we're definitely going to go over time. We started about 15 minutes late. We'll shoot about 15 minutes over. So hope you're not staying up too late.
And don't forget, we have Astronomy Cast over on other channels after this. And I'm sure folks will be putting the links in the chat so you can follow and see Fraser and Pamela doing Astronomy Cast. It's a crazy night for streaming, that's for sure. Okay, Vulcan, Vulcanism on Venus. This was a big deal this week. This was one of the coolest stories that I ran across. And I get all the press releases, so a lot of times I'm in there and I'm like, wait a minute, what? Uh, basically, they have found traces of olivine, which is a mineral in basalt. And given how quickly it reacts with the atmosphere, you can tell how fast it has been coming out on the surface. And so basically, by looking at this, they've determined that there are some volcanoes on Venus currently active. I mean, very recently. And so what this does is this gives us another planet in our own solar system that has active volcanism going on, which is really cool because then we can take that and compare it to Earth and see how it's the same and how it's different because Mars doesn't have any current volcanism. It's not geologically active. So this gives us some something that we can see very easily and be able to compare in this situation. So I got to admit, I'm a little skeptical here. And I haven't read the paper, but I've sort of read over some of the work around that. And the, what I get from it is the general gist is that they did some experiments in the lab and they realized that some of the stuff that would come out of a volcano would sort of chemically change really quickly. And thus, because we still see this stuff on the surface, it must be coming out of the volcano like now, not you know, a billion Not years in the ago past. or something. Yeah. And I, I, that all seems like good work. I think I'm just a little skeptical that we really understand the chemistry that's happening on the surface of another planet. It's, Especially you know, Venus, which yeah, has so well, much crazy stuff going on chemically. So, yeah. Yeah, I just, I just, I wonder, I mean, it would be amazing if we could land down and just see lava coming out of the volcanoes, but these kind of indirect things, I hope that there's something we can do uh, from orbit with uh, something, you know, that we have there right now to try to, to check some of this because, you know, it's so tantalizing, but right. these lab experiences or experiments can be sometimes just so slightly different than reality. And that's the difference between <laughs> like the chemical reaction happening in a year and like a million years. Yes, so this definitely is one, an area where they're going to need to do more work and hopefully we can send some additional probes to Venus. They just have to be very tough because nothing lasts on Venus very long. So let's build some better probes and send some stuff there and see what else oh, we can I, find. I know so many planetary scientists that are like desperate to yes. send stuff back to Venus because you know, it's been Mars, Mars, the moon, asteroid belts, Titan, Europa. It's been decades since NASA has sent anything to to Venus. And really, it's kind of been the, the stepchild the whole whole time. Right, because it's just so hard to have something stay there long enough to do anything. So All right. this is the time. The Lava closest. surfing. This is your opportunity. Yes, it's, it's the yeah. closest. So it should be the easiest to get to. So fingers crossed. Yeah. So the story that caught my attention the most in the last like long time, but at least, you know, this year uh, was the news that came out right after the new year in uh, the um, New England Journal of Medicine that at some previous time, some astronaut out there uh, was treated for what seems to have been an extremely severe blood clot uh, while on the International Space Station. And for, for privacy reasons, they're keeping the when uh, and the who uh, private for this. All we know is that this happened two months into a six-month mission. And the astronauts, you know, they're constantly carrying out little experiments that go up and down on the various supply missions. And they were working on an experiment where they were taking ultrasounds of their neck to study how fluid distributes throughout the body in zero gravity. So they were taking all these ultrasound pictures and sending them back to scientists on Earth. And somebody happened to just look at one of the pictures and be like, oh, no. And they found this blood clot in the astronaut's jugular vein. Uh, and the science term for this is deep vein thrombosis. And most of us are only really at risk for this if like, we're on bed rest 
um, for for months, or you cramped in a really uh, long plane ride. You get these blood clots that form, and if they break free and end up in the lungs, then they can cause a pulmonary embolism, which in about a third of cases causes death, especially if you can't be quickly uh, treated, which you know there aren't a lot of uh, lung surgeons on the space station. And so they found out that this astronaut had the clot and they were able to start treating it with a very small supply of blood thinners that they happened to have on the space station. But they had to kind of ration those out and wait for the next resupply mission to send up, you know, like the whole pharmacy worth of uh, anti-clotting um, medication. And, and the astronaut took it and got back to Earth and it was just fine. The, the blood clot went away and, and everything was good. But it, it just got me thinking about we are so unprepared for a year-long trip to and from Mars or something like that. Because, you know, there are a, a thousand different problems that can go wrong that have never happened before. This was the very first time in 60 years of spaceflight that uh, an astronaut was known to have a blood clot in space. There's, you know, this endless list of stuff that's never happened. And we just can't possibly take enough medicine to treat every one of those for a year. It's like you blast off to Mars and three days later, uh, you found out you have some really serious thing, but you don't have 600 days of, of blood thinners on, on your Mars spacecraft. And so it just, sort of drove home for me how much work we still have to do to understand what the relative risks of these things are so that we can, you know, safely uh, and, and healthily send our astronauts out on these long duration space missions. Uh, so I'm seeing a question here uh, about whether this was an issue while the astronaut was on the ISS. Uh, and, and the answer is no. The astronaut didn't even know that he or she had this particular uh, problem unless they had sc scanned themselves. And when they got, it's kind of like you go to the doctor, you feel great, and they tell you, oh, no, something's really wrong. Uh, then, then you start to worry, but, you know, sometimes nothing, nothing comes of it. And they actually took the astronaut off the blood thinners. Uh, the like week before they landed because they were afraid that if something went wrong with the landing and they had like a, a crash landing or something that, you know, if you're on blood thinners and you get, uh, you know, injuries, you can have a lot of internal bleeding, your blood's not coagulating. And they figured it, it was a higher risk of a problem happening with the landing than the astronaut suffering from the, the blood clot in that, that last week. And so that, that tells us that, you know, by then they had a pretty good handle on the situation, uh, but it didn't have to go that way. And, and, you know, we've seen some of these stories in the past about people having to do like surgery on themselves in the Antarctic station. Uh, and, and there, at least they can like send, a, you know, send a plane with a doctor to, to come help you, uh, you know, in space, sir, there aren't so many space doctors. So you had another story, uh, Susie, about the first Earth-sized planet found in the habitable zone by Tess. What's up with that? Let me go and pull that one back up because we have time for it. <laughs> <laughs> but basically, they think they have found um, the equivalent of another Earth as far as, you know, something, a similar shape and size. And let me get that pulled back up. Because, of course, I closed that while I was doing this. Because <laughs> streaming is fun. Um, yes. You're building no, here, the plane in flight. Yes. So the test mission basically announced that they found this rocky Earth-sized planet. And it's in the habitable zone of an M dwarf star, which is similar to our sun. Um, I don't think it's exactly like it, but it's, it's similar smaller. to it. Yeah, it's a little bit smaller. And they did a bunch of atmospheric models to see if this planet would be uh, habitable. And they said, basically, if you find Chicago habitable, you'd be fine on this planet. <laughs> so cold, but tolerable. And so they're studying it more. They're going to be following up with Spitzer Space Telescope to uh, measure various things and to figure out more. But it looks like an Earth-massed rocky world in our 
what we would call the Goldilocks zone, similar to our own solar system. So that's pretty exciting. Yeah, this was kind of the whole goal of TESS, was to find these candidate planets really close to us so that when we launch James Webb in the near future, we can point James Webb at something that's just 100 light years away, and we can learn all about it. We, you know, we, we'll be able to learn all about uh, what's going on in its atmosphere. Does it have clouds? What kind of composition might it have? Uh, and you know, we found plenty of Earth-like planets uh, in the habitable zone uh, with something like Kepler. But those planets tend to be like thousands of, of light years away. And we just will never be able to image them or take spectroscopy of them in the same way that we can with these, these nearby ones. And so it's really exciting that finally we've sort of struck gold with what, what Tess had set out to, to do. And, and now we just kind of get into the, the sort of what if game. Uh, because, you know, if it has water and it has an atmosphere, that's great. But a lot of these dwarf stars have really powerful magnetic fields or really strong solar flares. And it might be the temperature of Chicago uh, there, but it might be like being in Chicago while standing inside a microwave. You know, yeah, that's, that, that wouldn't be fun. <laughs> but, but not <laughs> ideal for life. Uh, and we're going to have to wait for James Webb to to learn more about that that is kind of the the running gag is we we have to wait for james webb space telescope for this it's, it's but, gonna come it's gonna come it's, it's gonna, gonna come, come at some point come. pamela might actually talk about it one day if it <laughs> actually comes to existence so before we leave, I wanted to mention uh, Starliner because we've been a few weeks now since we had a weekly space hangout. And I think most people probably know that uh, late last year, Boeing launched Starliner on its demonstration mission to the space station. And things didn't exactly go as they had hoped. The launch seemed to go fine, but then shortly after the launch, it started burning its rocket at the wrong time. It ended up in the wrong orbit with not enough fuel to, to fix itself. And they had to bring it back down safely to Earth without attempting this docking with the space station. Uh, and we found out this week that NASA and, and Boeing are moving forward with a, a team that's gonna spend the next few months investigating what went wrong and make sure that uh, this thing was kind of an isolated incident. They think it was just the clock was set wrong. And if that's the case, that's probably not a big deal. But if the clock was set wrong because of something else, that could point to a bigger problem. And so they're going to be investigating this for, for, for a while now. And the big question that NASA has to answer is, does Boeing need to do it again? The whole point of this dress rehearsal was to go through all of the phases of a successful crewed mission to the space station without actually having the crew on board. And they launched just fine. They demonstrated that they could maneuver in space just fine. They landed just fine. The parachutes worked. But they didn't actually do that critical step of autonomously docking with the space station. And given all the other things, you might conclude that it's likely that that'll work just fine. And if not, the astronauts on board will be able to, to take control and, and dock it manually. But that wasn't the original plan. Uh, they were supposed to demonstrate every step of the process. And so now we wait and NASA decides, are they going to make them launch another mission, which would probably push Boeing's first crewed mission to the space station to much later in the year. Or are they going to decide this was a sort of an isolated problem with a known solution and, and give them a pass to move forward with preparing for the crude launch? And so we'll keep an eye on that in, in the next few weeks and uh, the next few months. And actually, Morgan, I would be a little worried that they may decide to push ahead just simply because when Pamela, Annie, and I were down in the Cape at, uh, in December, they are definitely fully on board and fully in, uh, in promotional gear for all of this mission. So I'm a little worried that maybe they may get in a hurry and try to push this a little harder. So I'm hoping maybe they'll do another test and make sure everything works perfectly before they put people in there. 
That's my hope anyway. Yeah, absolutely. And we're coming up in the next week or two on the abort test for SpaceX. And if they can successfully abort uh, the Crew Dragon, then they'll have advanced to the stage of being ready for their first crewed mission. Go so, Crew Dragon. Uh, depending on how this goes, I think it's still sort of a possibility that either of these companies could be the first one to um, privately deliver crew to uh, the space station, but it, it really does feel like we're finally in the home stretch. You know, we've been talking about this since like 2013 or 2014. And it has been a long time. It's been delayed and delayed and delayed. And I, I'm going to say it. I think 2020 is the year it's going to happen and we're going to move on to bigger and better things. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Susie. You're an outstanding co-host. Oh, and thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Annie, <laughs> for uh, producing. I am not looking at the final output, but I assume that it's beautiful. It and, looks great. Yeah. And thank you, Fraser and um, Brian, for, for joining us. Thank you, Nancy and Paranor, for relaying questions to me uh, behind the scenes. I didn't ask a lot of them, but I, I read many of them, and I hope some of those got worked into uh, our discussion with Dr. Whedon. Uh, and the regular crew will be back next week. Fraser will be here to save us. Everything will be normal. And we'll explore some more space. Happy podcast day, everybody. Take care. Happy podcast day.